Hello and welcome to another video which is part of my of Mice and Men revision series. Today we're going to look at Slim and Curly and we're going to ask ourselves how is John Steinbeck using these two characters to talk about power and authority? This is particularly relevant to those of you studying for your GCSEs or IGCSEs in English literature. So with everything with of Mice and Men we need to ask ourselves this question. What is John Steinbeck trying to say about society in 1930s America? So I would advise you before we even get going, pause the video now and think about this question in regards to Curly and in regards to Slim. What was John Steinbeck trying to say with these characters? Now, obviously, I will give you my thoughts after this, but it might be that you have some amazing ideas. So if they're not covered in the rest of this, please do pop them in the comments below. But let's define our terms. So the, when we say power, power is defined as the potential of an individual to influence others. In contrast, authority is defined as control delegated to an individual or group. So if we take a classroom as an example, the individual with the most authority in that room would be the teacher because they've been given that form of control by the head teacher. However, that doesn't necessarily mean they have the most power because if some very charismatic, exciting young student stood up and did an inspiring speech and inspired the rest of the class to revolt against that teacher, well, in that case, that student has more power. Please don't try that at home, but I'm sure you can think about um, perhaps how those dynamics play out in different situations in your life. So we need to, again, question. We've got Curly. Curly's in one of the characters, apart from the boss, who has the most authority. But clearly not a good guy. In contrast, Slim, not as much authority, but much more power. So what could John Steinbeck have been saying about the people in with authority in 1930s America? Have a think about that. So let's look at how Curly is described when we first meet him in the novella. At that moment, a young man came into the bunkhouse, a thin young man with a brown face, with brown eyes, and a head of tightly curled hair. He wore a work glove on his left hand, and like the boss, he wore high-heeled boots. So as you can see, John Steinbeck repeats the word young when he first introduces Curly. So what he's emphasising, I believe, there is he's emphasising Curly's inexperience and his immaturity. Not all young people are immature and inexperienced, but I think if you emphasise someone's age, that's potentially what you're saying. He also talks about Curly having a head of tightly curled hair. And if we think about what Curly is like as a character, he's pugnacious. He's quick to get angry. He's, uh, you know, got a real temper on him. So again, this image of this tightly curled hair, it's like a spring, almost something that's tightly wound, ready to explode at any point. And this is interesting. Curly wears high heeled boots. Now, I want you to perhaps think about some movies you might have seen when you when you have some kind of CEO or someone, you know, with a lot of power authority and you go into their office and it's very, very imposing. Uh, and perhaps their chair will make them higher or make them bigger than the person opposite. They'll give them a lower down chair. This is, I think, what John Seibick's saying about Curly here. Curly's trying to make himself bigger. He's trying to reflect his status by wearing these high heeled boots. However, Curly's actually a little guy. So the boots therefore kind of symbolize it's not actually natural authority that Curly has. It's man-made authority. Um, he in himself is a little guy, but he tries to make himself a big guy, but he's not successful in that. And you can see, um, I found three other quotes here that kind of talk about Curly being small. So Curly's a little guy, but Lenny watched in terror the flopping little man. <laughs> That's um, in the scene where Lenny crushes his hand, but makes him sound a little bit pathetic, I think, the flopping little man. And Curly was white and shrunken. Okay, so um, John Steinbeck does, I think, emphasise Curly's small size, but he tries to make himself bigger. But it doesn't really work. He's still seen as a little guy. But again, when we first meet him, he glanced coldly at George and then at Lenny. His arms gradually bent at the elbows and his hands closed into fists. His glance was at once calculating and pugnacious. So this is literally the very, very first time we meet Curly and it's the very first time he meets George and Lenny. So for, for no reason whatsoever, he immediately starts closing his hands into fists. 
and pugnacious is quick, someone who's quick to fight. So he's, we've got this immediate leap to violence in Curly. John Steinbeck's linking the idea of authority and violence, you know, man-made authority being something that's a violent idea here. Curly stepped over to Lenny like a terrier. What the hell are you laughing at? Lenny looked blankly at him. Huh? Then Curly's rage exploded. He slashed at Lenny with his left and then smashed down his nose with a right. So remember, Curly's a boxer. So already Curly's associated with something violent, something um, physical. But it's interesting, I think, that John Steinbeck uses a simile like a terrier. Because if you think about dogs, you think about a dog that's perhaps perceived as strong or powerful, you probably wouldn't think of a terrier. You might think of a German shepherd. Um, terriers tend to be those small little dogs that yap at people a lot and they think they're scarier than they are. So I think it's quite telling here that John Steinbeck refers to um, Curly as a terrier. He's someone that has a lot of violence in him but isn't actually that powerful of a creature overall. And then we have Slim in comparison. So let's just, you know, um, recap that. Curly has the authority, but is intrinsically linked as, as, as being something violent. In comparison, the first time we meet Slim, Candy actually compares him directly to Curly because he says, hell of a nice fella. Slim don't need to wear no high heel boots on a grain team. So what he's saying there is actually Slim doesn't need any kind of prop to make him seem more powerful because Slim has that intrinsic power. Slim is someone that people gravitate towards, someone who can influence the people around him. And every time we meet Slim, this kind of image of him being like that is extended. So this description below, a tall man stood in the doorway. He moved with a majesty only achieved by royalty and master craftsmen. He was a jerk lion skinner, the prince of the, prince of the ranch. He was capable of killing a fly on the wheeler's butt with a bullwhip without touching the mule. So we've got these words here associated with royalty. Majesty, royalty, prince. Now, if we think about those words, um, or if we think about historically uh, how royalty was seen, royalty was something that was chosen by God. If you were the king or the queen, the idea was that that, that person had been chosen by God. So not not man-made, something spiritual. So again, Slim Slim's kind of presence and his leadership skills is something that is inbuilt in him. It's not something that's been created um, by, by men. And he does not need to wear those high-heeled boots like Curly does. So again, we've got this juxtaposition with Curly. So whereas Curly has to kind of have this the prop of his violence and his high-heeled boots, Slim is a natural leader. His is kind of inbuilt in him. So what do you think John Steinbeck might have been saying about um, the people with authority in 1930s America? You know, if we think about these migrant workers going from farm to farm to farm with no, um, you know, not able to get their own land, not able to pursue their own dreams at the whim of the ranch owners. Potentially, uh, John Steinbeck's criticising or um, the fact that these ranch owners are the ones with the authority versus, you know, the people who might have very good leaderships like leadership skills like Slim. Steinmet goes on. There was a gravity in his manner and a quiet so profound that all talk stopped when he spoke. His authority was so great that his word was taken on any subject, be it politics or love. His hatchet face was ageless. He might have been 35 or 50. The fact that when Slim talks, people stop and they listen and people listen to whatever he has to talk about be it politics or love because slim is someone that people choose to go to whereas curly is someone that they are forced to go to and they're forced to respect curly not because they like him but because otherwise they might lose their job and i think it's interesting here that um john steinbeck says his hatchet face was ageless because with curly he emphasizes his age he's young he's young but with Slim, age is irrelevant. He could have been 35, it could have been 50. It doesn't matter because he's clearly born to be a leader. And we've also got this role of, of Slim being almost like a judge because in the scene where um, Candy has his dog taken away from him, 
when all the men are kind of saying, yes, you know, your dog smells, your dog smells, that's, you know, he's no good to himself. The last person Candy looks at, looks at is Slim because he's hoping that Slim will kind of give him um, his dog. And instead, Slim says, you know what, that dog ain't no good to himself. Steinbeck emphasises that Curly is young, but Slim's age is irrelevant because he's a natural born leader. These are some quotes that Slim uh, says to George. He says, you guys travel around together. His tone was friendly. It invited confidence without demanding it. I like this, uh, this kind of invitation to confidence, which John Steinbeck repeats in the second quote. Funny how you and him string along together. It was Slim's calm invitation to confidence. So again, we've got this idea that if you're a powerful leader like Slim, you don't need to force people to listen to you or force people to do anything. People will want to because they trust you. George looked over at Slim and saw the calm, godlike eyes fastened on him. So Slim is even compared to God here. Perhaps Donald John Steinbeck is criticising the idea that those people in charge within you know, the ranch, within society, are perhaps not the people who have the skills and, and the kind of God-given ability to, to do that well. So there's something wrong with the system. And a natural leader doesn't need to make things happen through violence. Curly immediately you know, uh, closes his fists, whereas Slim is a calm invitation to confidence. So we've got this constant juxtaposition between Slim and Curly. And again, I, I talked about this quote earlier, he was capable of killing a fly on the wheeler's butt with a bull whip without touching the mule. But again, his hands, large and lean, were as delicate in their action as those of a temple dancer. So Slim is a big guy, he's a farm worker, but he's still got this delicacy. He's not clumsy. Um, and that kind of comes across when he speaks as well. He chooses his words wisely. So he's a wise and delicate man. Again, the opposite to Curly, who just immediately wants to start a fight all the time. And finally, let's think about um, racism. So Slim is also one of those characters that shows real respect to crooks. So not many of the characters show a lot of respect to, to crooks, but and crooks isn't really a fan of many of them. But we see him, he calls Slim Mr. Slim. So we've got that term of respect from Crook. So obviously the way that Crook sees him is a little bit different to how he sees the other men. Slim took his eyes off from old Candy. Huh? Oh, hello, Crooks. What's the matter? So we've got this, I think, quite friendly tone here when Slim talks to Crooks. He doesn't um, dismiss him. He asks him what's wrong. And later on, when Crooks is talking to Lenny, when Lenny's in uh, his room, Crooks says darkly, guys don't come into a coloured man's room very much. Nobody been here but Slim. Slim's not afraid to go into uh, Crooks' room like many of the other guys. So perhaps what is John Steinbeck saying then about racism in society when we've got this very natural, wise leader who treats Crooks with more respect than, than many of the other characters and isn't afraid to go... Uh, into his room. It's also juxtaposition with the boss who gives Crooks hell when George and Lenny showed up late. So Candy at the beginning uh, doesn't even call Crooks by name. He calls him the stable buck. He says, yeah, the stable buck gave him hell when you were late. So Candy not using his name, uh, kind of finding it funny that Crooks had a bad time because the boss was angry. Um, there's a phrase, kicking the cat, the idea that people, when they're angry, they go and kick the cat. Crooks in this example is the cat. The boss is angry. He goes to take it out on Crooks. However, Slim is different to that. He doesn't, uh, he treats Candy with, I'm um, sorry, Crooks with respect. So if we think about the idea of natural leadership versus kind of man-made authority, let's have a look at how else this theme is shown in the novella. And this is the very, very beginning uh, in the description of the brush. A few miles south of Soledad, the Salinas River drops in close to the hillside bank and runs deep and green. On one side of the river, the golden foothill slopes curve up to strong and rocky Gabalan Mountains. But on the valley side, the water is lined with trees. Willows fresh and green with every spring, carrying in their lower leaf junctures the debris of the winter's flooding. And sycamores with mottled white recumbent limbs and branches that arch over the pool, Rabbits come out of the brush to sit on the sand in the evening and the damp flats are covered with the night tracks of coons and with the spread paths of dogs from the ranches and with the split wedge tracks of deer that come to drink in the dark. 
So we've got this very long description. This is actually just a very, uh, I've just taken a part of it. But this very kind of natural, beautiful description of out in the brush away from uh, the ranches. There is a path through the willows and, um, willows and among the sycamores, a path beaten hard by boys coming down from the ranches to swim in the deep pool and beaten hard by tramps who come wearily down from the highway in the evening to jungle up near water. In front of the low horizontal limb of a giant sycamore, there is an ash pile made by many fires. The limb is worn smooth by men who've sat on it. So again, we've got repetition, beaten hard, beaten hard. So it, we've got this idea of violence associated with the boys and the tramps who come to this natural, beautiful environment. Um, and that's kind of the idea is furthered by we've got these fires that have been made by again by men and we've got the limb has been worn smooth by men. So the beautiful nature has been altered by uh, men who have come into it. And, you know, violently altered. And then we have the water snake, which you might remember appears at the very beginning and at the end of the novella. A water snake slipped along on, on the pool, its head held up like a little periscope. Now, the water snake, if you have a think about what that could represent. This is an allusion to Genesis. So the snake, if you uh, know the story of uh, in Genesis in the Bible, um, you've got Adam and Eve living in uh, the Garden of Eden, which is somewhere perfect. And then the snake tempts them. And as a result, evil is brought into the world. Again, we've got this idea, we've got this beautiful Eden type description. But it is men, humankind that comes in and basically messes it all up. So we've got this allusion to Genesis here. So that idea of something natural being disrupted um, by something, by violence. So let's go back to this question from the start. What is John Steinbeck trying to say about society in 1930s America? We've got this idea of power versus authority, power being something intrinsic that's inside of you, authority being something that's linked with violence, um, Curly being this little guy who's trying to make himself bigger, he's trying to force something that's not there. We can link that to the description of the setting um, where we've got something natural and beautiful, but then it's been tainted and um, uh, violently altered by humankind. So what's perhaps John Steinbeck saying about society? Perhaps he's saying that things aren't as they should be. Society was not going well in 1930s America with huge rates of poverty, huge rates of unemployment, uh, racism, sexism. So have a think about this question and perhaps pop your ideas in the comments below. I'm going to be putting out more videos every week um, on Of Mice and Men and other English literature and language resources. So please do let me know if there's anything you want me to cover or ask any questions below and make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any of those videos.